first question, guys, of course, is why do we as practitioners need to have a form of appointment? I think I might suggest that we ask, perhaps, Mark, if you would start us off with um, a legal perspective on why architects need appointments. Okay, well, from a legal perspective, um, if you think about the courts, uh, whenever there's a dispute, the f starting point will be uh, what is the written agreement. So um, a written agreement is important. It's in the interests of certainty so that everybody knows what, every what they're doing, what their duties are, what their obligations are, and what their rights are. Um, and I think the RIBA um, suite of documents has been put together um, with the benefit of accrued experience over previous um, uh, uh, documents and previous incarnations to try and get a balanced agreement so that everybody is, is if you like, happy and, and has their interest reflected. Um, because otherwise, if you're thrown back on just well, what you think the parties intended, often a court will just um, uh, put into a contract the bare minimum to give the relationship what's called business efficacy, and that will not necessarily um, assist either party. Mm, I agree. But, um, Dita, there is um, a current f um, code of conduct. There's a new one just about to come out, um, which, as a member, actually, we, we've signed up for this. Um, that also has a bearing, does it not, in Absolutely. the code? Yes, um, as architects. We've got a legal obligation to meet the Architects Act, which has the Architects Code. And like you say, as members, we're obliged to meet the RIBA Code of Professional Conduct. And both codes are quite clear and explicit mm. that we have a duty to have a written agreement in place with our clients, which make it quite clear what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, how we're going to be paid for it. So absolutely essential to meet those codes. And and what we need is a, is a good code that's understandable by the practices and by their clients. Um, may, I might come to you, Barbara, next, because obviously there are a lot of small practices. 80% of the practices in the UK are small practices, and that's 10 people or less, so the, the projects are ne of necessity going to be smaller. So why is it, do you think, particularly relevant for smaller practices? to have an appointment, is it necessary for everyone of their little jobs? Well, I can definitely understand why for small practices it can feel like it's too much, like we run very small projects, often many of them people ask themselves, is it really needed? I think the point to make would be it's especially needed because many of our clients are non-experts, sort of we work for homeowners, we work for domestic clients, we work for small businesses. We work for people, for many of whom this will be the first um, architectural projects they have done in their lives or will ever do. And there it is especially important for us as the expert, as the consultant, to take our clients through this journey, explain to them exactly what, the, what our duties are, what their duties are, take them through all the risks of the projects. And rather than sitting there for hours and taking them through all of that, the contract is actually a really good point by point, like a guiding tool nearly that we like to use in our practice to make sure we address everything and also to ensure we come to the most sticky and difficult points and make sure we educate our clients on those as well. So you don't find it too difficult for your clients to understand why there is an appointment document you're asking them to sign? No, I don't, because when you explain to the clients what is involved in the project, then it actually puts you on a good footing where sort of we are the professionals. We explain to them, we teach them, we educate them, and they are actually grateful for that. And a bit of clarity can really help them. And clients might be scared, clients might be overwhelmed, but I think you can take them on this journey. What about the larger clients, Nigel? <clears throat> how, how do they see these forms of appointment? Are they a nuisance? Well, I mean, so, some will use them, some won't. Um, yes. I think, you know, fundamentally, if we're saying, why do we need a form of appointment? Um, the fact is that some things in life are pretty straightforward. If you ask someone to paint a fence, you don't really need a contract. But 
building contracts are fundamentally complicated, complex. So we need to have a way of setting down all the all the key issues. From large, um, from clients' point of view, um, and you're asking about large, larger projects, um, to be honest, some of them won't be using uh, the RIBA standard form. They'll be using their own bespoke versions. Um, but we would always guide them to, um, to the sort of terms and conditions in, in the standard form because they are thorough, fundamentally well considered. So the, really, the, the answer is you still need an appointment? You absolutely need an appointment, yes, whatever you're doing. And uh, I, I have no idea. I only run a medium-sized practice myself, and I use the standard forms because I am not set up to be able to change to something else. But for a larger project, presumably, you need to have some help to make sure your appointment has all the terms in it that you need. Yeah, well so it's a, good, it's a good way to... So I, I spend quite a lot of my time looking at um, bespoke contracts for, for our projects that, that were sent. And it's a useful reference to be able to refer back to the standard form to say what should we be looking for to be included in there and a, a useful comparison. So, yeah, at least from that point of view, they're, they're very valuable. But... Uh, but actually, we'd always recommend to clients that they should be using the standard form because they have all sorts of advantages over a, over a bespoke one. So in, for any size of project, then? Very much. Any size of project, from smallest to the largest project, you should always have Absolutely. And contracts. Absolutely. And there are a range, of course, which cover all the different sizes of contracts. Yeah. So we've got here, we've got a version for um, uh, the, the, the standard version, which is for the larger projects primarily. But we've also got the concise version for smaller commercial projects, we've got domestic version, and uh, we've got uh, also a sub-consultancy and a principal designer version. So we've got the complete suite there. Very good. And Very if we're just talking about the importance of having a contract, there are certain things, whatever size of, of project, there are certain things that everybody is going to be concerned with, things like copyright, what happens to copyright, um, how much is it going to cost, uh, and if there's a dispute, how is it going to be resolved? And I think at least as important um, as putting in the appointment what will be done for an architect is to define what needs to be done by other people, what won't be covered, because an architect tends to be the sort of the default. If there's ever a gap, the client will go back to the architect and say, well, what's happened here? What, why wasn't this dealt with? Mm -hmm. So a properly drafted appointment which sets out what needs to be dealt with elsewhere is, I think, very important. Yeah. Another Fundamentally, why. why do we need contracts? Because it's hellishly complicated. Yeah. And we've got to write this stuff down. We can't rely on word of mouth and trying to memorise it. You can't have a verbal contract for a building appointment. It's just too complicated. So, I have a quick note on the sort of question of bespoke contracts, because even though we are a small practice, we are also, we have to deal with bespoke contracts because we work for public sector clients and they tend to have their own contracts. And we obviously can't afford a legal team or anything like that. Neither can we say no to these projects. So like you, of course, we try and push the REBA terms and conditions, uh, which is um, often futile. And what we have actually learned and what is good advice and what we didn't know from the beginning is that we can send these contracts to our insurance legal teams and free of charge, they actually make sure that they do not violate the terms and conditions of our PI insurance. And the most obvious thing to look out for is the reasonable in an architect has to provide reasonable duty and care. The reasonable gets dropped really, really often. And that is like an absolute absolute terrible thing and definitely something to look out for. Gosh, it sounds ghastly, doesn't it? So, <laughs> I mean, it, it, the, the, the truth is, what we're talking about is a construction world that is a minefield and that these documents will help both the clients and the, their architects through that minefield uh, with some considerable clarity, I'd say.